Here we go. Good morning, everyone. To those of you here in this room, the handful of people, and also to those who are with us on Zoom. I'm Ben Ogles, Dean of the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences. I'm pleased to welcome you to the 28th annual Martin B. Hickman Outstanding Scholar Lecture. Today, we'll be pleased to hear from Dr. Kelly Patterson, a professor in the Department of Political Science. Before turning to our speaker, I want to briefly introduce you to Martin B. Hickman, the university faculty member and administrator for whom this lecture is named. Martin B. Hickman came to Brigham Young University's Department of Political Science in 1967, and then just a year later, he was named the interim dean of the College of Social Sciences. He were, uh, then two years later, he was named the permanent dean and served there for a decade until 1970. Uh, in, and in, I mean, beginning in 1970 to 1980. In 1980, he was instrumental in restructuring the college and adding parts of the, what was then called the College of Family Living to form and become the founding dean for the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences as we know it today. As dean, he helped uh, to establish the Women's Research Institute, the David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, the Family Studies Center, and other research efforts. He also helped to conceive and organize and oversee the American Heritage Program, including participating as an instructor. Martin was a remarkable leader who used a significant por portion of his career to serve the university and the church and his colleagues. As a result uh, of that excellent leadership and his contributions in the College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences, it's, it's appropriate that this annual lecture is named in his honor. Martin was very loyal to the college and his colleagues, and this was only uh, surpassed by his devotion to his wife, Joanne, and his six daughters. And we're uh, pleased that some of the Hickman family have joined us remotely today. They faithfully support this lecture and we thank them for continuing their connection with the college. Uh, both uh, Dr. Magleby and uh, Dr. Patterson knew uh, Martin Hickman and they may say something about that. We'll now uh, ask Dr. David Magleby, a professor emeritus in the Department of Political Science and former dean of this college will now introduce our Hickman Outstanding Lecturer. Thank you, uh, Dean Ogles. Uh, it's an honor to have been asked to introduce this year's recipient of the Martin B. Hickman Scholar Award, Kelly D. Patterson. Kelly was born in Twin Falls, Idaho. His roots there are deep. His undergraduate education was at BYU in political science he served a mission to France, uh, where he acquired a lifelong affection for all things French. In 2018, he was able to reinforce his French connections and interests when he was invited to spend a semester at a very highly regarded uh, research center in Paris. I first met Kelly uh, when I joined the BYU faculty in 1981, one year before he headed off to Columbia University to pursue his PhD. David Bone, who himself received his PhD from Columbia, describes Kelly as an undergraduate in the following terms. He demonstrated genuine goodwill and good humor on our study abroad experience. His clear thinking and on the most of abstract subjects distinguished him as a student and then later as a colleague. While at Columbia, Kelly benefited from the influence of several faculty. One in particular stands out, Robert Shapiro, the Wallace S. Sayer Professor of Government at the Columbia Department of, of Political Science. I asked Professor Shapiro to describe Kelly as a graduate student. He responded, and I quote, Kelly's stellar completion of our doctoral program gave us a big psychological boost. He came here because he wanted to study with us in particular. And he showed we could cultivate a PhD student from his start to his dissertation to publishing his first articles and his first book. The bonus was our faculty and students benefiting 
from his overall kindness and other personal qualities. From Columbia, Kelly accepted a faculty position at Franklin and Marshall College. One of Kelly's colleagues at f and was Sid Wise. On more than one occasion when I was talking to Sid, he would say, Kelly is a remarkable teacher, scholar, and departmental citizen. Now, it took time for us to lure Kelly and Janine Patterson away from the East Coast, but he has made a tremendous difference in building political science at BYU, building the college and building the university. His reputation was recognized externally as well, when in 1992 to 93, he was named an American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow. Kelly worked with Congressman David Price, himself a political scientist who had previously taught at Duke University. Jean Louise Beard, who worked for Congressman Price, indicates Kelly was, quote, the staffer, close quote, for the Democratic Caucus Issues Task Force. Now, Price, the congressman, was so impressed with Kelly's work that he acknowledged Kelly as, quote, an able political scientist, close quote, in his second and third editions of his book, the Congressional Experience. When I contacted Ms. Beard to learn more about Kelly's activity as a Congressional Fellow, she said, what I remember about Kelly are his abundant good cheer, easy conversation, and authenticity. He was both earnest and upbeat in everything he did, and the staff liked him enormously. As mostly North Carolina natives, we were not well versed in the LDS church. And he graciously and sometimes irreverently indulged our questions. When asked about the challenges of his mission work, Kelly recalled it as a time when he came to hate his bike. As a scholar, Kelly has focused on political parties, campaigns, campaign finance, polling, and the voting process. His book, Political Parties and the Maintenance of Liberal Democracy, was published by Columbia University Press. He has edited multiple books, published scores of journal articles and book chapters, and has had success securing external funding for his research. He clearly more than meets the high standards expected of the Martin B. Hickman Scholar Award. As a teacher, Kelly is always prepared and engaging. One of his most important teaching contributions has been in the American Heritage course. Kelly and his fellow American Heritage professors have helped make this course a model course in BYU's general education. One of Kelly's fellow American Heritage teachers is Chris Karkowitz. He describes Kelly's contribution to the American Heritage course as being both substantive and pedagogical. Chris notes that, quote, working with Kelly has improved almost every aspect of my teaching. And I regularly look to his example of what it means to be a scholar, disciple, and teacher at BYU. Finally, as a citizen of the university, Kelly is also deserving of this recognition. Only a year after being promoted to associate professor and receiving tenure, Kelly became the chair of the political science department. This was a time when our department was in transition working to reinforce professional norms and standards. Kelly demonstrated leadership and courage as department chair for six years. He has done the same more recently as associate dean in the college. Now serving in administration is a sacrifice and comes at a real personal expense. Uh, we in the department in the college have been the beneficiaries of Kelly's sacrifice and others who serve. Dean Ogle summarizes Kelly's administrative contribution as he was an important advisor to the Dean, along with overseeing the rank and status, awards, and other faculty related aspects with grace, good humor, efficiency, and high standards. Quite a bit of similarity in terms of personal attributes across those individuals I contacted. Kelly has been blessed to have a wonderful spouse, Janine, and fun loving children, Kate and Andrew. They have been supportive of him and he adores each of them. So in all respects, Kelly D. Patterson is most deserving of being named a Martin B. Hickman Scholar, 
Now we have the privilege of hearing his lecture. Kelly? Um, thank you, David. That was kind and uh, charitable and, and, and overwhelming. Um, it's maybe a sign of old age when you hear all these people from the 80s and 90s talking about you, I guess. Um, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real honor to, uh, to have been introduced by such a, a wonderful person as David. Uh, he and I, over the years, have had a spirited, oh yeah, I'll take off the mask. He and I have had a spirited competition over the years about bow ties. Um, I felt like the Soviet Union during the Cold War uh, being spent into oblivion uh, by David's uh, bow tie purchases. I just couldn't keep up. <laughs> just, it's, so it's a, it's a bit like uh, Ronald Reagan uh, securing the victory over the, the, the old, his old nemesis, the Soviet Union. Um, I would like to welcome you here today, especially the American Heritage students who are maybe tuning in. Um, you should recognize some of the themes from American Heritage in today's lecture. I would also like to welcome my colleagues from the college and from my department. It has been a privilege to be your colleague. It is a significant honor to be asked to deliver the Martin B. Hickman Lecture. It is a pleasure to have members of the Hickman family joining us today uh, to celebrate him. He was the dean of the college when I was an undergraduate student, as uh, you, you've heard. I met him many times and felt his care, love, and concern for me. When you looked into Dean Hickman's eyes, you saw wit, intelligence, and compassion. It was the compassion that stayed with you and set an example that all subsequent deans have followed. We have seen that compassion for students and others in the eyes of Deans Pope, Magleby, and Ogles. In this way, Dean Hickman's influence continues to flow pleasantly, humbly, and steadily through the activities of this college. We gather together today to remind ourselves of this influence and to celebrate the way in which his life has touched generations of students and scholars. Before we get started, I would like to thank a few people. I would like to thank Dean Ogles and Associate Dean Laura Padilla-Walker for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> they didn't have to, I know that. <laughs> there are lots of, there's so many deserving in this college. I would also like to thank the college and the Department of Political Science for the funds to support this research. It was not cheap. I would like to thank my colleagues and co-author, Professor, or my colleague and co-author, Professor Chris Karpowitz. Uh, his fingerprints are all over this uh, presentation today. He is a remarkable scholar and teaches me something new whenever I talk to him. I would also like to thank our research assistant, Ethan Meldrum. We have asked a lot of him over the last few years, and he has risen to every challenge. Finally, I would like to thank my family, and especially my wife, Janine. All of the members of my family have endured too many days of me wandering around the house, bumping into things, while puzzling over the empirical and philosophical meanings of individualism. Today, I would like to present something that Professor Karpowitz and I have been working on for years, and as part of a larger book project on individualism. We've spent countless hours refining the measures, we've conducted multiple surveys, and we've presented the research in multiple academic venues. And it's probably fitting that we're presenting this on the one day anniversary of the pronouncement of the pandemic. I had no idea that that was the case until I heard it on the radio today, but quite fitting, I suppose. We want to present something today to honor Dean Hickman that is both fresh and timely. So to do this, let's start out uh, like we do in American heritage, and that is with the big question. What is the big question? And the big question is, when we create societies, how do we create societies that have both an emphasis on individual rights or a regard for the community? Sometimes you can do both, sometimes it's one, sometimes another, but it's really hard to do. And this uh, recognition of how hard it is to do is found in Federalist Number 10, the, fa the famous uh, uh, paper written by James Madison, a number of citizens when he's talking about a faction, whether amounting to a minority or majority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion, okay? And this common impulse of passion can threaten two things, one, adverse to the rights of other citizens, 
or to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. So Madison has this clear concern for both individual rights and liberty at the same time that he's thinking about the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Now, this uh, concern was uh, brought forward even more clearly as uh, all things French, uh, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, the, uh, the, the, the French aristocrat when he came to visit the United States in the 1830s, his assessment of, of, of the United States. And he argued or observed that um, citizens in the United States are individualists. And this is how he defines individualism. Individualism is a calm and considered feeling which dispossess, disposes each citizen to isolate himself from the mass of his fellows and withdraw into the circle of family and friends. With this little society formed to his taste, he gladly leaves the greater society to look after itself. So this, with this little society formed to his taste, that's what's fascinating, right? So once you have your own little world set up, you withdraw from a larger society. So you can see how this is a dynamic that would uh, uh, feed this concern that uh, Madison had for uh, both the permanent aggregate interest of the community, being able to think about the community, as well as uh, uh, protecting those individual rights and liberties to form those communities, okay? So, um, Today, as we think about the tension between these two poles, it really makes sense for us to reflect on what individualism in modern America means and whether or not it empties out the public square in a meaningful way that prevents us from pursuing those sorts of activities and uh, uh, pursuits that uh, would benefit the larger uh, nation. This is a quote from Michael Sandel in his book, Justice. Our students and, and faculty in American heritage and teaching assistants in American heritage realize this. This is a, a, a concern that Michael Sandel uh, articulates quite easily. He says, the hollowing out of the public realm makes it difficult to cultivate the sense of solidarity and sense of community on which democratic citizenship depends. Okay. So here we have this dynamic, individual rights, individual liberties, freedom, individual freedom, uh, as well as talking about the permanent aggregate interests of the community, the idea of some larger uh, social purpose. So um, we've seen this rhetoric surrounding the pandemic. <laughs> um, has made us, the pandemic has made us particularly aware, if you will, of, of the tensions between individual rights and liberties and the public good. And this is the rhetoric that we see in the headlines. Uh, wearing a mask, a uniquely American pathology, to be required to wear a mask in the extraordinary times we live is no constraint on my freedom. Uh, no mask, no mask mandates aren't unconstitutional. The true freedom, the true face of freedom wears a mask. America is drunk on a warped idea of freedom and now it's killing people. And this is my favorite that just occurred the other day in the sun, a British tabloid. Feed them to the fire, shocking moment, Idaho kids toss COVID mask into burning trash can at burn the mask rally. <laughs> so uh, th this is a particularly uh, interesting moment in our nation's and state's histories about the idea of uh, the trade-offs between pursuing something that's both public and something that is uh, uh, a reflection of individual preferences and tastes. Now, um, this is, um, an engram analysis. If any of you have uh, followed the work that Bob Putnam is doing in his most recent book, The Upswing, he talks a lot, a lot about various trends. And one of the uh, data sources that he uses is this, uh, an engram analysis, which is something that's been developed by Google that goes back and basically searches every book published in English for the different word in which you, uh, the different word you specify. So this is a, a measure, if you will, of the, 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 the amount of 
you know, the, the proportion of times this word is used in, in, in the, the number of books available. Uh, n-gram refers to, as we'll see in just a second, the n is for a number of words that you can search. You can have a one gram, two gram, three gram, four gram, just depending on the number of words in your search. But you can see that individualism has become a preeminent word, a prominent word in, 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 in uh, uh, American society. Uh, here is individualism and the public good, so there's a gap, <laughs> a rather significant gap uh, between the two. Um, this, uh, this are phrases associated with individualism. I do what I, and then you have the engram, fill in the, 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 uh, the blank, basically. So it, it will pick the word that most likely comes up the most after I do what I, and then it'll, it'll, it'll specify what those words are. What we can see is I do what I do, I do what I can. These are all individualist expressions. I do what I want. Anybody who's a product of the 60s will see this. Oh, there it is, back again, good. Um, it's a little bit like teaching American heritage. You always have to sort of be on, the, on, on you know, a little, a little nimble on your feet. But you can see, so some of these expressions that are uh, individualist expressions, the increase of those, particularly over time. Uh, here we have another one, do what you, and of course, um, we have the individual expressions, do what you want, do what you can, do what you have, do what you do, do what you like. Anybody, once again, who's sort of a, a uh, a product of the 60s, 70s, and 80s will understand those expressions as, as, as being uh, uh, symbolic of a, a certain way of thinking about freedom and our role in, in society. Uh, here's some concepts associated with individualism that I, I, I really like. Um, no right or wrong answers, no right or wrong way. Okay, so along with individualism seems to come this sort of moral individualism, the idea that what is right or what is wrong, what is good or what is bad is uh, basically a, 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 a matter of, of preference, of individual preference and taste, okay? So um, the individualism and, and the American character, it's pretty, those two things uh, go, go hand in hand, they're synonymous with each other. So what we do, we think, we know, is that individualism is a distinctive feature of the American character. When you compare the United States to a variety of other countries on, a, on some, um, some generic individualism scores, America always scores at the highest level. Um, so I want you to remember what Tocqueville said about individualism who says, with this little society formed to his taste, that is his own little world, his own little life, which is another way of saying that the individual has established for herself her own version of the good society or the right way to live. Um, given that uh, situation, the individual gladly leaves the greater society to look after itself meaning withdrawing from the public sphere, meaning uh, not as likely to engage anymore in, sort, in, in, in public oriented kinds of activities. So here when we're thinking about this, and this is the way that Professor Karpowitz and I have been thinking about it, individualism may lead to an abandonment of the public square and a refusal to see the ways in which our personal pursuits can stabilize community pursuits. So, uh, Think about it this way, as uh, 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 the penchant for individualism goes up, the regard for public effort, public sorts of activities goes down. Okay. So once again, back to Madison's formulation of the problem. Is it possible to pursue both individual liberties at the same time that you are uh, seeking to achieve permanent or aggregate interests of the community? Okay. So uh, this leads us to think about a more precise and uh, uh, um, kind of modern uh, definition of individualism and the way in which people think about it and the way in which it's expressed in modern American society. And uh, political science has thought about this for quite some time. But uh, the understudied element in political science is the relationship between the self and authority. When we're thinking about individualism, what we often think about is 
people telling me what to do, or institutions outside of me making demands on me. Okay? Um, and individualism, as it, as it has been conceptualized in Western political thought, involves the individual as the primary, or perhaps even sole source of all authority on matters of importance to the individual. <laughs> and once again, this is uh, those of you who are students of, of, of Western intellectual thought will recognize this, right? The, the, the recognition of the individual and then the celebration of the individual and the, the liberation of the individual from all of those constraints that, uh, uh, that, that people found so constraining in the Middle Ages. So on this view, the individual has the capacity to determine the course of her life and the values that will define that life without outside interference. So it sounds a little bit like Tocqueville's definition, that we, we now have the opportunity to uh, construct our own little life to our uh, own preferences and tastes. And we do that without institutions making any sorts of claims or demands on us. And if those claims or demands are made, as we're going to see, they are illegitimate claims or demands that uh, can't take precedence over what the uh, individual uh, defines as the good. So often, in, uh, at least in, in sort of current ways of thinking in, in, in some, some forms of, of, of Western political thought, this is uh, the term often attributed to this outlook or this form of individualism is called self-authorization. Uh, that um, and we'll talk more about this self-authorization in a moment and what its implications are, okay? Now, um, as I hope I've made the case for, political science should be really interested in this concept of individualism. It should have all kinds of impacts for the way in which we think about political activities and government enterprises and the idea of the public square, what citizenship means, and all these different things. And yet, um, when we're thinking about these different values, like welfare, equality, liberty, and individualism, it's interesting that individualism in the Political science has been measured in a distinctly economic way. <laughs> Mainly, um, this is how political scientists for decades have thought about individualism. Individualism is an economic activity. Eco individualism is in relationship to economic activity. So when you go to the ANES, which is the big study that's done on um, on political life uh, every couple of years in the United States, the American National Election Studies. These are the questions. This is the battery of questions that they have for individuals. And you can see it has that distinctly economic frame to it. Any person who's willing to work hard and ha has a good chance of succeeding. And there's good reasons why this is the case. I mean, I, I, this, America is a capitalist nation. America is a market, uh, has a market economy, and market thinking pervades a great deal of the way in which we think about ourselves and our relationship to others. So it's some, you know, it makes some, some kind of sense that, that they would settle on, on, on this uh, a set of, of, of questions to form the scale that measures just how individualistic someone is. But uh, there are dimensions of individualism beyond the economic arena. And I've tried to uh, uh, allude to those today when, when, when Tocqueville is talking about uh, uh, individualism, this idea of tastes and preferences become really important. And he's not talking necessarily about tests and preference, tastes and preferences in some sort of economic way either. He's talking about how to live the good life. So um, other dimensions of individual that emerge that we've already talked about is this belief that authority is external to the self-constrained liberty, that, that institutions by and large are, are, are an impediment to the achievement of individual uh, liberty. Now, once again, our students who understand, our students in American heritage, we tried to get you to think a little bit differently when we talked about the Puritans and when we talked about some of these other traditions in American politics, that there are these institutions that enhance freedom and help you achieve freedom as opposed to simply being an impediment to that freedom. And the second dimension is the belief that only moral choices that are self-authorized are legitimate. Somebody else telling you what is right or wrong, is good advice, but it has no sort of epistemic claim on you. <laughs> right? the, the, the ultimate 
decision maker when it comes to thinking about what the good or the bad is, it comes down to some sort of uh, individualist preference or uh, preference uh, uh, by the individual. Okay, so uh, Chris and I set out to create a measure of moral individualism, <laughs> thinking that uh, this, this was an understudied subject and uh, the economic frame that had been used in political science wasn't adequate to explain all sorts of uh, political activities and behaviors that we were seeing. And so we set out to create this measure of moral individualism. And I'm going to present data today from two nationally representative samples of residents uh, of the United States. Uh, these surveys were conducted by YouGov, uh, a wonderful survey uh, operation uh, run by a couple of great scholars that we know. Uh, we did the first survey in August of 2018, and those of you paying attention will know that that's pre-pandemic. Uh, 2018 seems like such a great you know, nostalgic time now. Uh, and then the second one, we, the second survey we conducted, it was in July of 2020, when the implications of what all the, you know, the, the spread of the virus was going to mean, mean for society and government were becoming clear to everybody, okay? So um, to create this uh, measure of moral individualism, we took two steps. The first is we asked people to identify important sources of authority and influence for each respondent. Okay, so every respondent in the survey was uh, asked this question. Think about the choices you make about the best way to live your life and what is best for society. Below is a list of some of the people who might be important to helping you make these decisions. Which of the following is most important to you? And Chris and I, Professor Carpenter and I did a great deal of sort of like background work, like qualitative work, pilot surveys where we honed and refined the measure before we actually went out to Dean Ogles and asked for real money to do stuff so that we had a good uh, understanding of what the, the set of reference would be. Uh, to get people thinking about these reference, we also included a little writing exercise where we asked them to think about the referent and then write why that was so important before we then asked them uh, a series of other questions. But what we see is that these are the groups that, that come out as the most important reference that people have when they're thinking about uh, uh, how to pursue the, the, the good and the, the, the just in a, in a moral society. Religion, family, science, teachers, work colleagues, good friends, well-known media personalities, and what the pub public generally thinks is right. That, those those uh, reference came up the most. If you don't think those reference are real, <laughs> look around your neighborhood. Uh, there are signs that talk about science is real. People are asserting that science is real. On the flip side, you have signs that say God created science. So these references are out there. Uh, people adopt them. People proclaim them. They put up yard signs, which is, um, you know, as, a, as a political scientist, I find baffling since not many people put up yard signs for much of anything anymore. But they do for these sorts of things. Okay. Um, so from our two surveys, you can see what people say the most. What we have here are uh, family receives the highest, num you know, the, the largest proportion of referent mention in both tw uh, 2018 and 2020. Religion and science uh, um, are kind of next up, but they switch places in 2020. <laughs> and, and, and maybe this, this, these are sort of context effects in the heart heat of a pandemic that make people think more about Dr. Fauci than about uh, uh, some sort of religious leader. But whatever, it's, it's, it's a fascinating sort of, uh, of finding. A good friend, um, about 10% of the time is mentioned as the reference. And then other, those other individuals, teachers, public opinion generally and the like, are all folded into those uh, other categories. Okay, so once we do this, we've got what their referent is, we then ask about the respondent's willingness to substitute the authority's judgment with her, her own judgment. So we ask a series of questions. And just imagine this question, answering this question for yourself, right? That if you think that religion is the most important to you, then we would insert this, the values that come from my religion are really no better than my own personal values. And people would, on a five-point scale, say how much they agree or disagree with that statement. And from this series of questions, 
about judgment, about what is right, what is wrong, about authority and the like, we are able to create this scale that we call moral individualism. This is the moral individualism scale. And uh, we think what this moral individualism scale tells us is just to what extent people are willing to assert their own individuality against some authority that would be important for helping them to decide what is right, what is wrong, or what to do in society. Okay, And this is, uh, we combine the reference, like I was saying, with the questions that those, they answered about the referent into these uh, two uh, forms. Um, wow, that sort of washed out a little bit. But this is, this is what you get as a distribution of, of, of uh, the moral individualism, moral individualism scores by referent. So those who identify science or religion as the referent score lower on average on the moral individualism scale. And that, uh, that, that, that seems to make sense, right? Those epistemic frameworks of moral, of, of science and uh, religion can be pretty compelling and makes pretty uh, uh, significant demands on us. And those who identify family or friends as their reference score higher on average on the moral individualism scale. In other words, willing to push back a little bit more against some of the advice or some of the, the, the notions of right or wrong that they receive uh, from those uh, different uh, reference. Okay? So um, what does all this mean? <laughs> Uh, so, Professor Karpowitz and I are talking about what this means for both politics and what it means for public life in the midst of a pandemic. And so, first off, we're going to talk a little bit about the American dream. Is there, are there differences about the way in which people conceptualize what the American dream is depending on where they score on this moral individualism scale? So how does moral individualism affect what a person thinks is the uh, American dream? Individuals who score score higher on the moral individual scale are more likely to say that freedom to do whatever you want and finding personal fulfillment are important to them. <laughs> right? it's, it's, it's sort of an, an interesting, um, these are um, the coefficient, uh, the, the effect of the coefficient on these different uh, uh, likelihood of saying, that, you know, agreeing that this is what is part of the American dream, okay? So moral individuals clearly think that the American dream is the freedom to do whatever you want and finding personal fulfillment. And then at the bottom here, we also have moral individuals are also less likely to say that making a difference in the community and having a happy family are important to them. So it sounds like the, there might be some sort of implications for the way in which we, we, we think about the society, what the good society is, and, uh, and, and, how, about, and how we go about achieving that. Um, this is moral of indiv individuals of civic engagement. Here we're talking specifically about do they do any volunteering at all, and uh, do they do any political participation? So we've asked how many forms of volunteering would the person find enjoyable? Turns out moral individualism is associated with a decrease in indicating interest in any form of volunteering. You just, you, the, 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 the public sphere has its, has its, has its domain and, and, and it shouldn't intrude uh, much for the moral individualist on into the personal or private domain. Uh, what was the person's level of political activity in the last year? Moral individualism is also associated with a decrease in the reporting of any form of political participation, uh, the, like the putting up of yard signs, making a campaign contribution, volunteering for a campaign, all these kind of standard measures of, of, of how we define uh, political activity over the course of, of a given year, okay? So let's talk about the pandemic. And here the, the, uh, the rhetoric can get pretty heated as we've seen over the last couple of, uh, uh, last couple of months. This is an article that we have our students in American Heritage read. It's called uh, by Damon Linker, who was actually a faculty member here for a couple of years when I was a department chair in, at, at BYU. Uh, and he wrote an article entitled, American Individualism is a Suicide Pact. And he says, uh, but underlying all of these sources of opposition to public health measures is a deeper cause that intertwines with and underlies all of them, at least in part, and that is the old-fashioned, pig-headed individualism of the American people. Okay. 
Now, what I think he means by this pig-headed individualism of the American people, we think is this moral individualism. That on a variety of these pandemic measures, moral individual, individualism turns out to be a much better predictor of behavior than, say, economic individualism or some of the other measures of individualism that we're testing uh, against these, uh, in these models, okay? So uh, moral individualism and the pandemic. Here we're talking about supporting officials, reopening the economy, and price gouging. We have a series of questions that basically ask people to uh, choose uh, between these two uh, choices that we offer them. Uh, the first uh, forced choice we gave them is support for uh, public officials. And here you're asked to come down on one side or the other. And the question is more important to listen to what public health officials are advising you to do or more important to do what you think is best, even if that differs from what public health officials recommend. And the moral individualist is right, much more likely to say, this is a change in the probability of support. So as you go from the minimum to the maximum on the individual, moral individualism scale, this is the change in probability of, of, of uh, uh, going along with uh, what uh, public health officials recommend. And it's, it's 30 points, it's a 30 point change in probability, which is, I don't know, for social science, that's kind of a big thing. But <laughs> so, um, reopening the economy, we talked a lot about reopening the economy and the trade-offs in reopening the economy, so we tested that one directly. Reopen the economy as soon as possible, even if more people will get sick, or continue to stay home for as long as necessary, even if the economy suffers. And there, once again, moral individuals are they're okay with opening up the economy. It's the higher you score on that moral individualism scale. And then we have these economic colleagues that we love dearly in the Department of Economics. And, and we always talk about the, the various ways of looking at the world. And, and economists will tell you, that, you know, price gouging is, is, is often works <laughs> because of the different uh, ways in which it, it ramps, can ramp up uh, production. So we asked about price gouging. And it says, uh, charge higher prices because it will make the shortage go away sooner, sort of a market solution to uh, the problem, or do not charge higher prices because it makes it hard for ordinary people. And there, the moral individualist is much more sympathetic with the idea of price gouging. Um, so we want to ask a couple of, we, we actually also kind of like wanted to put people in a, a sort of a, a scenario in which they're kind of forced to make choices or asked to make choices about uh, how they might contribute to alleviating uh, some, of the, some of the worst effects of the pandemic. So one question we asked them is there's a, 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 a drive going on now to help the homeless in the area. How likely would you be to go out of your way to uh, buy materials to uh, contribute to the homeless, uh, to this drive to help the homeless? And what we see is that um, under the homeless uh, donation, right, those people who are higher on the moral individualism scale, it's actually negative related <laughs> to wanting to contribute. Here we ask them you, to, to think about, they have a, 10 bottles of hand sanitizer, and they're asked to donate. How many of those 10 bottles would they donate? Higher on the moral individualism scale, correlates with lower amounts of donation of, of hand sanitizer. And then uh, donate masks. A person has 10, N 10 N95 masks, how many would they be likely to donate? And of course, uh, those people who score higher on the moral individualism scale are uh, always more likely to donate fewer, of the, contribute fewer of masks to uh, the, the effort as shown by um, these uh, And I also want to say, I put up these other columns, Chris and I did, the ideology and the partisanship, because people often say, well, you're, you haven't controlled for ideology, you haven't controlled for partisanship, and we have. We've controlled for ideolo ideology and partisanship for a whole host of other uh, measures, and what we see is that it's just not about ideology, and it's just not about partisanship. That this idea of moral individualism transcends ideology, transcends partisanship, and, and it seems to be an active factor in the ways in which uh, a significant group of Americans view the world. 
All right, so here are reported actions during the pandemic. Um, and these are self-reports of having engaged in efforts to help alleviate some of the effects of this uh, by the change in probability of doing uh, this action. So warn a mask in public. The moral individualist is uh, 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 less likely to have reported wearing a mask in public as part of their behavior during the pandemic. Uh, reaching out to neighbors who may need help, also less likely to do that. Uh, helping family who do not live nearby, less likely to do that. Uh, donated time to help others who are high risk, uh, still less likely to do that. Okay? And all of these, once again, uh, uh, effects are, are robust across a variety of specifications and, uh, and show very different patterns than even ideology and partisanship do, okay? So that once again, there is something really fascinating about individualism and the way in which Americans think about it and then how it manifests itself in a crisis that often calls for individuals to uh, set those individual preferences aside for some larger community effort, okay? So, uh, the conclusion, individualism is a prominent American value. It, it, it's at the heart of what we think it means to be American, and Tocqueville saw it in the 1830s and the 1840s, and now it's time uh, for us to kind of start to reckon with uh, the implications of that uh, individualism. Individualism has multiple subcomponents, of which moral individualism is one really important subcomponent. There is economic individualism. It matters uh, on some kinds of issues. There are other forms of, of, of individualism uh, that have been measured and, uh, by uh, social psychologists and others. They matter, but this, uh, this measure that uh, Chris and I have developed really seems to help explain quite a bit of what goes on uh, during uh, periods of, of crisis and also with, with orientations toward politics. Moral individualism promotes the self, but it makes it hard to promote collective efforts in various spheres, including politics and public health. Okay. And so I hope in some way that uh, today's lecture and the way in which we've thought about it um, truly honors the, the heritage of, 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 of Dean Hickman, who I see or saw as not an individualist at all. Thank you. Looks like the uh, camera's got me from the neck down. My size. There. <laughs> no, I'm Kelly's size. <laughs> this was a constant so, theme when I was his associate dean, I want you to know. <laughs> I did rub it in too much. Um, we'd like to congratulate Kelly, and we have here a plaque, the Martin B. Hickman Outstanding Scholar Award 2020-2021, College of Family, Home, and Social Sciences for Dr. Kelly Patterson. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. I'd like to take some questions, but we don't really have time. We know that there's a class that comes into this room, and because of the pandemic, we want to be mindful of that. So thank you all for coming.